There's been a little bit of a tussle on Facebook on the Superdrift series Facebook page. Uh, Rudy Rautenbach came in there and uh, gave a bit of a description of what he believed was drifting and power sliding and uh, mentioned names like Ken Block and the likes. Uh, Rulof Lowe came in there as well and actually wanted me to sort of describe it and uh, show my opinions and voice my opinions on the topic as he believes that I would have a bit of a different understanding of it. And I do. I don't quite re agree with what uh, Rudy had to say there, but uh, I will endeavor to try and explain my personal opinion on the two as I understand it from my technical viewpoint. Firstly, in order to understand the terms you need to know or understand drifting versus power sliding, you need to understand a little bit about the one, the terminology and two, about what happens, the physics behind grip and grip levels with a motor vehicle and with a tire. You need to understand that there is something which is known as a traction circle and it is loosely deemed to be a circle. Uh, all tires are different, all vehicle setups are different, so it's never a perfect circle, but for the purpose of illustration, we'll work with a circle. It has an up and down axis, and it has a left and right axis. These are joined by a circle that goes around it. Forwards and backwards motion is represented by the up and down, the A and B axis, while the X and Y axis speaks about your lateral forces, your left and your right. Now at any given point in time, you can only use the circle as traction. Anything outside of that circle is going to be a loss of grip. Now if you take a singular force, an acceleration, let's take that as being a rearward. The force that you would feel, let's say the g-forces that you would feel when you're pushed back in the chair. That moment of inertia broken and that acceleration, not the speed, Speed cannot be felt by a human being, only a change in speed can be felt. So acceleration and deceleration can be felt by the human body. The acceleration is going to push the body backwards. This is simple physics. Let's, so we take it down on that circle. It can only go to 100%. We'll take the circle perimeter as being 100%. Half of that is naturally going to be 50% and is going to appear midway up that axis. It's the same with deceleration. We'll take that from that center point, that stationary point, and we'll take it upwards there can only be 100% deceleration. Anything left and right, a turning force, a sideways force on that tire, on that contact patch on the road, is going to take it either way, either to the left or to the right, for you watching here now. Anything outside of that is going to be a loss of grip. That means that at any given point in time, you cannot use 100% lateral force, a turning action, and 100% braking or accelerative force. So, as soon as you go 100% deceleration and you start turning, you're going to realize that you're going to run straight out of the circle. You're going to have to decrease your braking effort in order for you to be able to stay within the circle and not run outside of it. That means that you'd only be able to use about 60% deceleration and 60% lateral force. That'll keep you within the circle and not outside of it. Gets a little tricky when you start working out graphs and that, but as I say, the circle isn't perfectly round. Different cars have different braking capabilities and different tires have got different grip capabilities. Anything outside of that is a loss of control. And from that loss of control, we're going to move on to two different aspects as well. This is understeer and oversteer. Understeer is where the steering input is greater than the steering angle of the vehicle. That's the technical terminology. Simply put, it's where the front wheels of the car lose grip. As you turn, you're obviously going too fast or you're applying too much steering angle and you leave that traction circle of the front tires. The momentum of the car is carrying it forward and you're asking it to change direction. You're asking of the tires to change the direction of the car. You're asking too much of it and the front tires let go. This means that the car will be carrying on straight and you can turn, turn and turn until you're blue in the face, the car will continue to go straight. The only way that you're going to rectify understeer is if you come off the power, as in bring it from the lowest point on that traction circle back within, or if you reduce the steering input, which brings it in from the side. As soon as it comes back within that circle, you'll have grip again, the car will turn. Same thing happens with the rear tires. Carry on driving, driving forward, and you've got that 
downward force. We're going to call it a downward force here. Downward force. As soon as you apply a little bit sideways or, or a sideways force to that tire, it is going to break grip. Okay? Rear tires, we're not turning them, so we have to encourage them to lose grip. And that can be through cornering speed. That can be through being on the edge of that sideways lateral force and then applying either a braking or an accelerating force to it that is going to allow it to brake traction. Primarily with drifting, it is the use of the handbrake. You can use weight transfer as well. Weight transfer is just going to push that lateral force over that barrier, that border of traction, that limit of traction there. So there are a couple of ways where you can initiate the drift. Understeer and oversteer, fairly simple to understand in those terms. Oversteer now, the steering input is less than the steering angle of the car, which means that you are not turning as much as the vehicle is turning. The vehicle's attitude and direction is somewhat skewed as opposed to your direction of travel. It's where the rear wheels lose traction. The rear wheels are now sliding whilst the front wheels have traction. Is it possible to have understeer and oversteer? A four-wheel slide, yes. A four-wheel slide is going to give you understeer and oversteer in essence. You have lost grip on both wheels. Your steering angle and your steering input is very irrelevant there and it's, the vehicle can only be steered using a combination of both the accelerator or the brake and the steering. What is drifting though? Drifting though, drifting is going into a corner sideways. I cannot stress this enough. It is going into a corner sideways. You need to hark and you need to track back to the Japanese mountains, the foothills where it started, racing up and down the mountains. Think of rally. A rally driver will drive his vehicle and he won't break it in a straight line using 100% of his forward his AB axis traction and then throw the car in. No, he's going to use a culmination of that and he's going to use the fact that tires don't turn sideways to slow the car down. This has got two benefits. One, pitching the car sideways into a turn before the turn allows him to brake later. He's using the sliding motion of the car and the fact that those tires can't turn sideways to slow the car down to an appropriate speed for negotiating that corner. Not only does this get him slowed down in time for the corner, but it also gets him pointing in the right direction for the exit of the corner. What has this done? This has just made his neck straight that little bit longer. He can now climb on the power a little earlier at a point where an ordinary circuit or grip driver would be still pointing outwards towards the exit point of the corner. He would now be facing straight down that straightaway. He can get on the power earlier and power down. Now, because he's not using all of his AB axis braking there, he can leave that braking later as well. Now, in two instances there, he has just made the straight longer. The straight is where he can put the power down. The straight is where he has control of the vehicle, full and utter control of the vehicle. It is where he can bang it through the gears, run it through the rear range, and make the most of the motor. So, the Japanese drifters and street racers adopted this. They would dive into the corners and they would pitch the car in sideways, allowing that to slow it down, helping them point the exit of, to the exit of the corner and climb the power a little earlier. It evolved from there to them hanging the tail out a little longer. Who could get the most angle? It evolved from there. It evolved to who could get the most angle, who could hold it the longest, who could keep the tail out the longest. But the drift is not the exit of the corner. The exit of the corner is the power slide. That is where you are applying power to the rear wheels to keep that traction on the outside or that force on the outside of that traction circle. That way with the wheels spinning, the car will naturally be in an oversteering nature, in an oversteering attitude, an oversteering condition. So let's go back to Rudy's statement about drifting and power sliding that. Ken Block, does he drift? Technically, yes, he goes into a corner sideways. While he is still applying power to the wheels, the car is sliding into a corner. What he does coming out of the corner, that is the power sliding part of things. Trust me, Ken Block knows all about this, having cut his teeth with 
rallycross and a full-blown rally and competitive rally, he knows about setting a car up for the exit of a corner. Can a front-wheel drive drift? Yes, a front-wheel drive can drift. By sliding into a corner, off the power, a front-wheel drive is technically drifting. Can he be competitive? No, he's not. He won't be able to power it down and maintain angle so that he'd be able to drift again, switch over and drift in another direction. He won't be able to maintain the speed because the power is going to the front wheels and the front wheels are controlling the slide per se or trying to correct the slide and keeping point in the right direction. It'll inherently try and pull the car straight. Yes, he can snake all over the place, but he is not going to be drifting in the true competitive sense of the word. Four wheel drives can drift as well. Rear wheel drives can drift. Just about any car can drift, but to drift competitively, it is best to use a rear wheel drive car. It is the most advantageous to use a rear wheel drive car for drifting. Front wheel drive cars, can they power slide? No, they cannot power slide. They have something which is known as lift off oversteer. Lift off oversteer comes when a front wheel drive driver drives into a corner a little too hot for what the corner is uh, throwing at him. And he will come off the power. Coming off the power puts the weight transfer forward. It lifts the weight off the back wheels. The center of gravity is shifted all the way forward. The nose goes heavy and the tail gets light. This tail getting light makes that traction circle so much smaller. Any sort of steering input at that point in time is enough to take it outside of that traction circle. When that happens, the tail of the car will naturally try and follow the path of momentum, its given travel path, and the tail will slide out. So that is lift off, oversteer. Yes, and it can be done in a lot of cars. It can even happen in a rear wheel drive car for exactly the same reasons. The nose gets heavy, the tail gets light, and the tail will then start sliding as that sideways lateral motion has broken the traction circle. Ask any Japanese judge if they judge the last half of the corner, the power slide part of the corner, and they will say that there is only place for them to lose points there. There is no points to be gained in that aspect aside from perhaps one or two impact points because that is where the smoke is supposed to come from. In all theory, there should be no smoke involved in proper true drifting. The drivers will come into the corner and that is what the judges are judging. Is their entry into the corner? How fast do they come into the corner? How controlled is that slide? Have they set the car up correctly? After that, maintaining the slide and setting the car up for the following corner is the role of the power slide coming out of the corner. There you compress the rear suspension and upon releasing it, you once again transfer that weight forward, the rear springs release, the back end of the car gets light, the traction circle gets small, and any sort of sideways input is going to get the tail of that car out. That is now what the drivers need to control. If they can place the tail of their car close to a wall, nose of their car close to a front arm car, front pavement, a clipping point, they're going to score high points. If they can pitch that car so that it is doing 90 degrees or more, they're going to score fantastic points. That is why the impact part of drifting is such a small percentage while it is a spectator sport, it's not about the power slide. It is not about sliding around. One of my biggest gripes in local drifting is that guys are so dependent on power. We have a lot of drivers, and I'm sure there's a few that come to mind, who as soon as they climb on the handbrake and get the car sideways and initiate the car, initiate, start the drift, they're back on the power. And they bang, 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 bang on the power, and you're hearing the car bouncing off the rev limiter, up and down, up and down, their angle and their speed is erratic because they are trying to power slide around a corner. They're not drifting around the corner. Drifting in its truest form is extremely graceful and is an almost silent slide into and around the majority of a corner. I hope this has cleared things up. Feel free to comment. Easy on the flames.